Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Paul. My name is Kimberly Todd and I serve on staff here at St. Paul and I am delighted to worship with you this morning. We are going to hear today in the story, we're, uh, another Joseph story, which we started last week from the book of Genesis. And in this Joseph story, we're going to discover that it takes courage to grow loving relationships with one another. I invite you now to prepare for worship by silencing any distractions that you have around you. To settle in, we will hear a, 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 a song and then we'll begin with confession and the good news of God's forgiveness for us. So I invite you now to take a breath and to um, settle into the presence of the living Lord this day. Okay. The psalmist declares, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. I'm Pastor Rob Mayalis, and welcome to St. Paul. And we're gathered here this day to praise the living Lord. And I'm sure if you're like me, the last week has been filled with some really beautiful moments and also some much tougher moments. But we're gathered here now into God's space and God's time. And so I invite you, wherever you've been in the last week, to just take a breath and know that the Spirit of the Living Lord is with you this day. us all to rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin 
Receive your forgiveness and groan of the fullness of Jesus Christ, Fear and Lord. Amen. Let us pause for reflection as we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. By grace you have been saved. Out of great mercy God sent the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And as he lives victorious from the grave, I declare to you that in his name your sins are forgiven. Amen and Alleluia. Together we join in singing hymn number 836, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God be with you all.
God rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. A reading from Genesis, chapter 37, beginning with the 18th verse. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of it, he, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we, if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite tra traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 140, a portion of Psalm 146 uh, responsibly as printed in your bulletins. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord. As long as I live, I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. <clears throat> Breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin.
Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus in a manner like evil things, and now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated and our children to come up for our children's message. Good morning, church, and hello, children. Come on over here to this area so that we can have some time together and you get a great view. I'm going to hand this over to you already, Joe. Here you go. So we are focusing on the stories of Joseph this fall. And we're focusing on them in the sermons, in the children's sermons, and also in all the adult uh, small groups that are meeting this fall. And so we're using the story of Joseph to connect to our own lives. And, and so to share the story of Joseph, every week I'm inviting a Joe from St. Paul to come and help tell us the story. So every week it's going to be a different Joe. And today we have a Joseph here. We have Joe Doster to help tell us the next part of the story. Last week we read about Joseph's family, his really large family. Today we have another part of the story. You can see it pretty clearly on the cover here. We're going to talk about this coat. So I'm going to open this up for Mr. Joe here to read to us. Good thing happened. Joseph's father gave him a beautiful coat of many colors. Joseph couldn't wait to show his brothers. But sin changed this into something very bad. Joseph's older brothers became very angry, jealous, and hateful. There are many feelings in the story of Joseph, and each of these feelings have a color. It would be as bright as Joseph's coat. The good news is God is with us through all the colors that we have. And we're going to stop there. So a lot today about colors. Now, Mr. Joe, yes. this question might be tricky for you. What is your favorite color? Well, obviously, I like many colors. <laughs> Way back from when, my favorite colors were blue and red. I never could decide which one, so I decided as an artist to combine them. So purple became my color, a combination of both of them. Purple. So Joe's favorite color is purple. Can I hear some of your favorite colors? Anybody know what theirs is? Is it an easy question? Is it a hard question? What's yours, Nick? Teal. Teal. Brianna? Green. Green. Jeremy? Purple. Purple. You guys have something in common. Karina, what's yours? Blue. Blue. What's Kennedy? She said blue, too. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your favorite colors. One way that we can use colors in this story is to think about colors and to think about all the different ways that colors can make us feel. There are a lot of feelings in this big story of Joseph. There's probably a lot of good feelings for Joseph to be so excited to get this beautiful coat, but there's also some feelings of jealousy that his brothers have about it and about the things that Joseph can do that they can't do. So the good news that Joe told us today is that God can handle all those feelings, all the colors that we experience. So every week that we do a part of the Joseph story, I'm going to give to you, boys and girls, a little sticker scene. I have the sticker scenes from last week. If you weren't here, you can take one of those, too. That's the one about your family. Today's sticker scene is about the coat. So here you see the scene. 
You get to decorate it with these stickers any way that you would like. But you see Joseph here with his father and in his very colorful coat. But before you take this, let's say a prayer and congregation, please join in. Repeat after me. Thank you, Lord, for being with us through all the colors that we feel. Amen. So I'm going to give these to Mr. Joe here to give to you, girls and boys. Come on up and take one. If you didn't come up and want one, uh, come on up now. Also, if you didn't get one last week, you can take one from last week. And I have the green children's bulletins that connect to the gospel today. Looks like she got them for your whole family. So green bulletins, sticker scenes. What's your favorite color? Is it hard to choose? Did you want one, too? Every fall, whether it's on broadcast, cable, or now streaming, there's always a new TV show that's based around kind of crime scene investigation, FBI, police, right? Like every, every year there's a new one of these shows that, that comes out. And so I've been sort of, again, seeing advertisements for those. And, and I almost feel like we could look at this story of, of Joseph uh, almost as if it's like made for TV. It's sort of crime scene investigation, ancient Palestine. And I want us to imagine that, that we have showed up on the crime scene and there's, there's been this transaction, this illegal sale of a minor into slavery, right? Joseph bin Yaakov, right? There's been this illegal sale of a slave, of a human. And our job throughout this episode is to figure out who's responsible, who's morally responsible, who's the who done it of all the suspects. And the, the obvious suspect is, of course, the brothers who seem to have done the deed. And uh, sort of the, the piece of evidence that um, really is compelling is that when they threw their brother into a well and he was likely crying for help that he was hurt, they just sat there and ate their lunch rather callously. But the more we kind of watch this episode, the more we realize that there are other people who may also be to blame. When we interviewed Joseph, we began to realize that this kid was really an arrogant young man who was actually not that likable and kind of drove us nuts. And we kind of said to ourselves, he kind of deserves to have a little bit of something happen to him, just sort of parading around about his dreams and so forth and wearing his coat so brightly. But then there's, back to the brothers, there's one in particular, Judah. And Judah's trying to say that he has an alibi, that, that he wasn't really wanting to hurt his brother. He thought the move to slavery would, would keep his brother alive. But I think his viewers were, were pretty confident that his greed was getting the better of him. But then there's the mysterious character that hasn't appeared yet in the episode, we've only been hearing about, and that's the father. And the father just so overlooks, and he's, he's trying to do something nice, but it's so often the case in families, the, the love of one means we ignore the others. And he sends his son off alone to check on the flocks, not thinking to himself what's going to happen. Obviously, the brothers are so mad at Joseph. And so, in what extent is the parent of this minor responsible for what has happened? But then at the episode, we finally meet the one other brother who returns, Reuben. And Reuben is the, the haunting character because Reuben knows the difference in right and wrong. He knew that this whole thing should never have gone down, but he, he seemed not to really do the right thing. He, he did the option. He, he took, a, as it's sometimes called, the Reuben option. He, he decided to do the thing that was kind of, sort of right, allowed him to sleep at night, but deep down inside he knew wasn't fully the right thing. Again, he kind of did the kind of sort of right thing. He knew he was on the right side. He knew right from wrong. He knew he wasn't one of the bad guys, but he didn't do the thing that really needed to get done. So I'm curious now, if you had watched an episode of this, how many of you would say, yeah, the brothers are to blame? How many of you think it really just should single out Judah as the problem? 
Anybody here think Joseph is to blame for this situation? What about Jacob, the father? Anybody want to blame the father? Yeah, how many of you want to blame Reuben? How many just want to blame everybody? Anybody want to blame everybody? This is a whole stinking mess. This is a whole mess these guys have gotten themselves into. But I want to move from a question of analysis now to a question of the heart. And I'm curious, what of these characters in this do you find the most resonance with? Do you have a sense that you have walked in their shoes? You feel indicted as you reflect on them. You know, their brothers this day are so sick of Joseph, so tired, so worn out from his constant presence in their lives that they're just totally callous to him. And I think this happens to us in lives. There are people, sometimes family, but people are so toxic, so aggravating to us that we, we just become deaf to their cries. But what about, what about how many of you might actually feel a bit more like painfully realizing you were a Joseph at some point in your life? A young, arrogant person who frankly needed to get smacked down by life. How many of us have had those moments where, like Judah, that our greed got the better of us, right? We, we took the promotion and in the process kind of jumbled up everything else in our lives. How many of us have been like Joseph where our focus, our focus on loving one person, we just didn't see the big picture and we tried to think we could finesse, handle, master a situation. We thought we were sowing the seeds of peace, but instead we were just sowing the weeds of discontent and strife, unaware of what was going on, unable to manage the situation that quickly spiraled out of our control. How many of us have been like Reuben, where we knew, we knew what was the right thing to do at the time, we just didn't do it. We didn't stick our necks out for what was right, what was the hard thing to do. We took the slightly easier path only later to realize that it wasn't enough. Mm. I'm not going to make you raise your hands as to who you were like. I think we know we've been all of these characters probably. We've, we've resonated with all these people at some point in our lives. It makes us want to ask another question, and that is, how could things have been different? How could have this story ended up with a different ending, a happier ending? I'd like to suggest that, that a key to this story changing would have been courage. I mean, courage could have made all the difference, but before I, I get to what courage is and how it could have changed this story, I'll just say that this, these stories of Joseph, we're looking at on a personal level, what they mean for us as disciples, but we're also thinking about what they mean for us at St. Paul how God is calling us in this season and, and in this place and time to be church. And last week we began with a reflection on our mission statement beginning with rooted in God's grace. And this week we keep going. We grow loving relationships with Jesus and each other. Again, we grow loving relationships with Jesus and each other. And of course that sounds really, really nice. Everybody wants loving relationships, right? They're all what we want. We want loving relationships in our lives. And towards this end, this fall as a church, we're trying to do some things to, to allow for relationships to happen, right? Whether it's a pancake breakfast, small groups. I could go on and on the ways which are trying to make room for us to connect to one another, to share our stories about life and the Bible together, to do projects of servanthood towards others. We're, we're trying to do this but we all know that, that really loving relationships is about more than simply enjoying pancakes together or a cup of coffee or having a conversation. Because ultimately, love in our relationships is tested. Ultimately, we go through times where sin and death and brokenness confront us. And in those moments when our character is tested, more than again just coffee and pancakes is required. And I'd like to suggest that if we're really going to have loving relationships in life, it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage. And again, by, by courage, I don't uh, simply mean something that allows us to, you know, win the race. But I mean that, that, 
that strength, that gift from God, that virtue that, that allows us to do the hard thing, even at a cost to ourselves, for the sake of others and the sake of life together. Again, courage is that, that animating force, that, that gift from God, that, that movement of the Spirit that allows us to do the hard thing, even at a cost to ourselves, for the sake of others and the sake of life together. Courage is not simply going online and yelling at people that they're wrong. Courage might be, courage might be the kid at lunch who goes up to the other person and says, why are you being so mean? Why are you being a jerk? Courage might, courage might be a spouse who says to the spouse, you know what? The last decade, you stayed home with the kids. And I know as a man this isn't as common, but I'm going to stay home now so you can work. Courage might also look like somebody who has a loved one who has dementia. And each day, in spite of knowing that it's going to be so hard, painful, even humbling, if not humiliating, they go and they provide care and love and support for their spouse or their parent and the rest of the staff who are working. That, to me, is courage when we, when we are willing to do something hard that's not easy, give up something of ourself, put our reputation, put our health, put our body on the line for the sake of others, for the sake of life together. And I think what difference courage would have made had Reuben done the courageous thing, had Reuben seen his brother off and Reuben gone and, and run to his brother, run to his brother and said, Joseph, you are in danger you are in danger, you need to go home now, and we're going to talk later about modesty and how you need to apologize to your brothers. And then gone back to his brothers and said, we're not going to harm him. He's too young. And if you want to mess with him, you've got to mess with me first. And give me six months to fix him. That would have been courage, and that would have changed the story. And I'm asking a lot here, I know. I know this is a high bar because this isn't what our culture teaches. You see, we're in a culture that's all about individual expression and individual achievement. But the way that I'm talking about here is an ancient way. It's the way of Christ. It's the way of courage. It's the way of giving up, putting on the line your reputation, your wealth, your life for the sake of others, for the sake of life together. And this is the way of Christ. This is what Christ did each and every day when Christ helped people, even at the, the leaders who had jeered him, what Christ did, even at the expense of his relationships with his family, this is what Christ did again and again and again until finally he lays down his life for you and for me, giving up everything in this profound act of courage. This is the way of Christ. Christ. It is also the way that will finally work its way back into the story. You see, courage will come again. And if you want to wait a few weeks, you can. If you can't, if you can't wait, you can go home tonight and read your Bible. But eventually, courage will come back in, and the brothers, Judah, Reuben, Joseph, and Jacob, will all have to have courage in their actions. And I would say, actually, chief among them will be Jacob and then Joseph, who will have to do the most courageous thing of all, and that is to forgive somebody. Because to forgive somebody is to welcome them after they've hurt you back into your life. To expose yourself to that. But this, again, is the way of Christ. Christ chooses courageously, again and again, to meet us. To meet us in the midst of the blame game of life and lay down his life for us. To forgive us and welcome us back into his heart and into the life of God. Amen.
confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Sustained and nurtured by our generous God, we gather as one to pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Watch over the church, O God, so that we may seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. Open our hearts to your restorative justice that we may be agents of reconciliation in this hurting world. Bless us with healing and wholeness in our relationships. Lord, in your mercy. Watch over your creation, especially the water that sustains us, where drought, hurricanes, and floods bring devastation. Give strength for healing and rebuilding in affected communities. We pray for local farmers as they harvest their crops. Lord, in your mercy. Watch over the nations. May the church around the world, especially in areas of violence, be a refuge and strength. We pray for the ref refugee care care kits today. Bless them and the hands that carry them around the world into places of profound fear and anguish. Make them into a sign of your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over those in any need. Have mercy on those who are grieving, suffering, lost, lonely, oppressed, underemployed, and imprisoned. Give strength to those who attend to relatives, serve the sick, minister to prisoners, and bring food or communion to the homebound. We lift before you the names of those in need of your healing. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for the saints and the way in which they modeled faithful living. Give us hope as we look toward the day when we will join them in your eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy. Assured by your promise to hear us, we lay our prayers before your throne of grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. We share Christ's peace with one another. I invite you all to be seated for a few brief announcements. First of all, again, warm, work, warm welcome to visitors, including those who are uh, worshiping for the first time with us online. If you're in the sanctuary, I invite you to fill out one of the blue pew cards. And if you're online, just drop us an email. Uh, also, in terms of uh, coming back inside this fall, uh, encourage you, if you, especially if you are trained in how to be a host or a communion assistant or anything, invite you to sign up for that. And if there isn't a way in which you're currently uh, helping out in leadership, love to talk with you about that. Uh, Helping to lead worship is one of the ways in which I think we can 
grow in our relationship with Jesus. Uh, today, one of the big things we're doing is uh, having the Lutheran World Relief Care Kits. I thank those, including children who, and youth, who worked on those. And again, we're sending those out, and those will be uh, blessed. Uh, we're praying for them today, and then they'll go out all across uh, the globe. Also, uh, we have our small groups around Joseph uh, starting. If you'd like to still be a part of one of them, let us know. And uh, this week, again, Pod and Pub is starting on Wednesday nights, another way to reflect together on this story. Uh, this weekend, we had a number of uh, our middle schoolers, I think almost a dozen, had, oh, head out to Camp uh, Nawakwa for a synod retreat. And I want to thank you for your generosity that allows us to subsidize that and make that affordable for families. So I thank you all for your uh, gifts and your faithfulness, and I invite us to rise as we present our gifts. together. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, it is our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, through Christ. And so at the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. After he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we do this, we proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Together in that hope, we pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to actually just, I want to offer sort of a little bit of a, a second part of my sermon here. And that is that we're all caught up in blame games all the time. But as you come to this table today, there is no more blame game. This is the table of courage. Courage in Christ that Christ extends to you. And I invite you this day to bring those parts of your life where you, you feel like you need to surrender that blame and 
and you need new courage in your life, and pray to Christ who will give you his courage. The table is ready. You may be seated. Courage changes the story. And courage is that force, that gift from God that allows us to do the hard thing, the thing that costs us something for the sake of another person and that allows us to live life together to the fullest. And courage is this laying down of one's life, which Jesus has done for us. We don't manufacture our own courage. It is a gift. It's the life that Christ has called us to and the, Christ, the life that Christ lived and died for our sakes so that we may be in restored relationship with God, in restored relationships with one another. And I echo Pastor Rob, I invite you to bring your needs before God, to come to the table of grace and to receive a word of grace for you, courage in your life for this week. If you would like to receive communion at home, be in touch with Pastor Wallace. His email address is on the screen. If you would like to talk or receive a pastoral visit, you can reach him there as well. And now, may God bless you and keep you. His light shine upon you and grant you peace. Amen.